Hello, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Anna. I am one of the co-organizers of Pi Ladies London. Um, a fun fact, I just started my new job at GitHub yesterday. So I'm in um, the process of onboarding. I literally just hopped off the onboarding call to host this meetup. So um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I do have quite a few announcements. As you all may know, we took a summer break from Pi Ladies London. Um, so this is our first meetup, I think, since May or June, if I'm not mistaken. And before I get started with the announcements, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you are not talking, please mute yourselves. I don't want to have to go through the list and have to mute people. It happens sometimes, but please keep yourself muted. Um, and then if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Please don't unmute yourself and interrupt the presenters. Um, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the session. Now on to the announcements, and I will be dropping all the links in Zoom um, in a little bit. Um, so this meetup, the way it took place is that Rad Miller from Manning Publishers actually reached out to me and she said, hey, I have a few really cool authors um, that would be interested in presenting at a meetup. Um, and Emily and Jacqueline were two of them. They wrote a book called Build, Your, Build a Career in Data Science. Um, and so Manning Publishers gave us a 35% discount code for all of you for all of their eBooks and I believe physical books as well. So I will drop the code and the link where you can purchase them um, in the chat. They also gave us one code for a lucky winner to win a free copy of Jacqueline and Emily's book. So if you're interested, there is a Google form that you can fill out. And then before our summer break, a company called uh, Jumping Rivers reached out to me and they donated a public training for the Pi Ladies auction at PyCon US. However, the person who won the training um, is in an unfortunate time zone. And so they offered the training to one of the members of Pi Ladies London because it's a better time zone. So if you're interested in winning the training, all you have to do is fill in the Google form, give me your name and email address, and then I'll pick, you, pick a um, lucky winner as well. And then finally, you may remember that before the summer break, um, the folks from Pi Data London reached out about doing a poll on data science. There's some government action going on in the UK right now about data science and AI, and the results of that survey were published in an article, so I will drop the link there as well. And then finally, so this month and next month, we'll do virtual meetups for sure because our presenters are not based in London, uh, but I am curious since some meetups in London have gone back to in person events, if government regulations allow it, uh, would you all be interested in having in person events again, if you are interested, maybe if you can give me a bit of an idea just type plus plus in the chat. Um, if you're not interested, um, that's fine. I just want to see if it's worth finding um, a venue to host um, in person events. And that's it from me. Um, so I will drop all those things that I just talked about. I will drop the links in the chat. Um, and now I will hand it over to Emily and Jacqueline, who will present on data science subfields. And what's really cool is they are actually recording this meetup for their podcast as a podcast episode. So yeah, I'll hand it over to the two of you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, you started your audacity? I did. Did you start yours? I did. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. I, I was testing it earlier <laughs> on this call. So, okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline. That's Emily. Um, we wrote a book, Build a Career in Data Science, as discussed. We also have a podcast that is largely about the book, but sometimes about related things too. And the thing we occasionally like to do in groups like this is rather than, um, rather than, just give like a conference talk or something. We like to record episodes of the podcast in front of you all. And then later we will actually edit it and put it on the podcast feed. So what you are about to witness is a unedited and raw version of what will eventually become a podcast in the future. So you are, um, you're getting advanced notice on these things. Um, that said, um, you know, there might be some times where you see behind the scenes stuff where we're like, no, we need to cut that. And that's um, just the way this works. Um, and at the end of it, the when we do the live shows, what we like to do is a, a little bit of a Q&A. So if you have questions for us about data science careers or the stuff we talk about in particular on this podcast episode, 
please ask that away. Um, we also like to actually get the recordings of the people actually asking the questions. So if you can use audio, that's great. But if you also just prefer to drop it in the chat, that is fine. And I will, we will, it will become clear when we are at that part of the podcast recording and we would like your help. Um, did I miss anything, Emily? Is that the? I think that's good. Okay, great. And we have like a whole speech as part of this podcast. So we're going to start recording. Yes, be and we do this trial. podcast thing. With cloud. Yeah. So like, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of figure it out, but like, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of figure it out. So anyway, you ready, Emily? I'm ready. Right, let's, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so I'm going to clap. So this is, yeah. All right. One, two, three. Welcome to Build a Career in Data Science. I'm your long lost host, Jacqueline Nolis. <laughs> and I'm also your host, Emily Robinson. This podcast is a data download into all the non-technical knowledge and skills you need to succeed in a data science career. In season one, each episode is about the chapter from our book, also called Build a Career in Data Science, but we are kind of out of that season and in between them. So um, you can also buy a book at the, buy the book at bestbook.cool and use and use the code buildbook40% to get 40% off, but you don't have to get it yet if you won't, and you won't get any less enjoyment out of the podcast. But, you know, do buy it if you feel like it. And this week, yes, please do. Um, and this week we are, season one ended a few months ago, but we are, we are pulling the podcast back out of the thing and into a live, more lively state by doing a live recording for Pie Ladies London, um, which we're very excited to be attending. Um, and I will try not to make British accent jokes as a American Yankee, um, but we'll see. And in particular, this live episode, a thing we we pondered, like what is a topic we hadn't really talked about in the book or the podcast, but it's important. And uh, a thing that came up are subfields of data science, which is to say, people talk a lot about like, do you wanna become a data scientist? Or do you wanna become a machine learning engineer? or maybe an analyst, but like you can actually break these down into like much, much more granular fields. For instance, there are people who are data scientists and their whole thing is experimentation, which we will talk about because we have an excerpt of those in this group, um, or forecasting or optimization. Like there's a lot of these smaller, tiny fields. And there's this question of like, how should you think about these different fields? How should you consider getting into them? And that's what we wanted to talk about this week is the little tiny inner parts of data science specialization. Yeah, because I think this also comes up when people are thinking about, oh, do I want to be, there's this idea of like T-shaped. Uh, so basically you sort of have a broad level of knowledge, but you go deep into one. And so do you, do you want to do that? Does it make sense for your career? So in addition to talking about what these subfields are, we'll also kind of ponder, um, you know, should you specialize? If so, in what? And what's it like also switching between them? Yes. And co concurrently, I think when people start data science careers, they also think they need to specialize in all of them. Like yes. you have to be an expert in experimentation and forecasting and after the, 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 um, and I think that was a learning for me in particular of like, oh, it is okay to not actually know all this stuff. That is fine. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, we have a list of like, just to start, we figured we'd just talk about some of the subfields that can show up and uh, you want to dive right in, Emily? Let's do it. Let's do uh, it. So I'll start off with, uh, as Jacqueline mentioned, experimentation. Uh, so this was something, so for my current job, I worked first at Etsy uh, and then at uh, Data Camp. And so at Etsy, I was in product analytics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But one thing I started doing there is experimentation or A-B testing. And then when I joined Data Camp, that was my whole role. Uh, so if you're not familiar, A-B testing is the idea of if you make a change to your website, like let's say you change what the registration page looks like, or you change the search ranking algorithm that powers your search results, uh, A-B testing is a way to tell, okay, was this effective in your goal of increasing registrations and increasing conversions, increasing average order value, whatever it is. Because the point is, if you just sort of launch the change, you watch how the graph moves, uh, like the, you know, say the conversion rate per day, that's quite noisy. Instead, you uh, show the change to often 50% uh, of your customers randomly, um, and then the old experience, the other 50%, and you, know, you use uh, statistics um, to you know, tell, okay, is there a, a significant difference between the two groups? And A-B testing, uh, so at uh, Google, Microsoft, Booking, some of these big companies, they can run thousands of A-B tests a year, um, so in those cases, there are often whole departments uh, who, so there are many different teams do A-B tests, but there are departments 
where there are uh, data scientists or engineers for building or maintain the experimentation system, this is their whole job, is often they might not even run the test themselves, uh, but they will help others do it. And so at Data Camp, I was uh, you know, joined as a data scientist to kick off their experimentation team. And their growth team wanted to start running experiments. So we started out with, uh, I joined uh, as a data scientist, we had an engineer, um, we had some sort of like uh, growth product managers who, you know, we all worked together to come up with test ideas, um, to design them, um, and to launch them. And I was responsible for basically make sure the statistics were good, sharing the results, you know, best practices for designing tests. And eventually we grew it so other teams could run it as well. Uh, so like I said, it's a bit different than what I'll later talk about Etsy, where I did a broader scope of things where experimentation was my whole role at Data Camp in first building that system and then kind of expanding it internally. All right, so here's my question. Did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you like doing that? I did. Um, I do think one thing, um, part of the reason I eventually left, among other things, was, uh, you know, it is one thing, right? It was definitely like a specialized role, like this is experimentation all the way down. And I think one choice I was kind of facing was, do I want to continue down this path, right? And say, like, my next role, do I want to go, you know, I think probably would have if I did, what would have been a good experience would have been going to something like a book and like a Microsoft, a team with a very mature experimentation, you know, kind of on um, the cutting, like the sort of, you know, quote unquote, like cutting edge of it. Um, because I, what I've done basically is it's A-B testing and sounds simple. There are actually like a fair amount of nuances in, you know, doing it correctly. But that being said, like when you're starting it, you get, you know, just doing sort of the basics, right? You get most of the value. Uh, versus at these companies that do, you know, experiments at a really large scale of kind of like eked out that kind of base value, then they're starting to do either more, uh, you know, often more complicated stats to, you know, get that last bit. Can we, can we get conclusions even faster, you know, how, or maybe on the engineering side, how can we run, you know, uh, you know, dozens or hundreds of concurrent experiments, which was something that I didn't have to deal with at the scale I was at. Okay. Okay. So I've barely worked in experimentation. Barely, like I've, 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 I've skittered on the edges of it, but I've generally avoided doing A-B testing like that. Cause I, as a data scientist, who's lighter on the stat side, see all that experimentation stuff and be like, oh, I do not know enough stats to really get that right. And like, I just don't have experience. Like I don't have that much experience in like, oh, how do we really set up the correct value of a control group and things like that? Not because like, I am like intellectually incapable of learning that stuff, but just my career has kind of taken a different shift. So like A-B testing seems like a place where it really kind of is like important to specialize. It feels like from the outside, because I at least have this perception of with A-B testing, it is trivially easy to make a tiny decision that ruins the whole thing. And well, that's thing one. Thing two is that stakeholders are constantly requesting you to make small changes that ruin everything. And three, it is your job to be the gatehold, gatekeeper of truth between the stakeholders who want to break everything and the true mathematics. And so you're grumpy all the time, which is why I let in with, did you like it? Because my understanding is just, it's like, it's it's a very easy to get frustrated in that field is total bias. But that's what I'm bringing to this podcast episode, by the way, it's just bias and like stereotyping of each of these different things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that was, uh, that could definitely be the case. I think that's where, honestly, it's helpful to have, you know, a manager who believes in you right and who is willing to like if say a VP and like another team is pressuring you to have someone who will kind of be like no like we won't uh you know we're not going to change this like often they're not like literally lie right they're like just make this number different but they're like oh what if we end the test right now right because the, there's a significant difference and you know if you're familiar with stats you can get uh you will get a much higher false positive rate like uh if you just like look at the test say you run a 20-day test you look at it every day and you end the test as soon as uh, the you know, p-value goes below 0.05, you'll actually end up with a much higher false positive rate. You can sort of simulate this out. Uh, so again, so the stakeholder there is like, I don't get it. Like the results are significant. Let's stop it now. Let's call this a win. Um, you know, and they may, they may sort of, they may one, not know why that, that would be a problem. Or even if they like kind of know, they're just, you know, they're in, maybe they're incentivized, they're uh, you know, their quarterly goals are, okay, launch X, you know, experiments with, uh, you know, increased revenue of Y amount. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can definitely have a little bit of that, that pressure. Um, I will say on the kind of like, oh, if I get the stats, you know, wrong because of ignorance, uh, that's what I sort of meant about the 
like, I think most of the value when you're starting out is not like super advanced statistics. It's, you know, it's knowing like maybe a little bit beyond like an intro stats, but like a power analysis, right. Of just, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, problem would be if, uh, you know, like a Bonferroni, like a correction for doing multiple testing, if you have lots of metrics, right. Or like why, or even just why that would be a problem. Uh, if you're like, well, I have 10 possible success metrics as long as one of them, you know, shows a significant difference. It's a win. Um, and, you know, that's where I do think, again, at these kind of larger places, you know, the expectations are a bit higher if you're, you know, kind of brought in as like, okay, they already got the basics, right? But that's also where I think you can learn, right? And so that's what I would sort of hope is that, like, I have some familiarity with this. There's, they also published a lot of papers, which is awesome, um, you know, on the, you know, with the math or, or, you know, there are even methods that aren't necessarily statistical for how to, like, just build a better experimentation culture. Um, but that was kind of what I was hoping is not necessarily thinking like, oh, I can come in and I can like bring some big innovation because I'm a statistics, you know, PhD or whatever, but that I could, you know, had enough experience to provide value, but also could learn that stuff again, if I wanted to go down that path. Got it. Okay. That all makes sense. Uh, maybe it doesn't sound as grim as it feels from the outside, <laughs> just hearing statisticians <laughs> complain about power analyses and stuff. Uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like there's no data science role where you're never like, uh, you know, have any like conflict or anything with stakeholders, right? That's, that's sort of true. An, I feel like that's pretty much an inherent part of the role. But I do think as we go through these lists of subfields that we've written down, I do think some of them have more than others. And I think A-B testing is probably near the highest in terms of conflicts with stakeholders. Yeah, that's fair. And, and before we go on to the, the next one, I do want to say what's interesting with this is, um, Something we have talked about on the podcast before is kind of the three different structures of um, like kind of data science, I guess, reporting systems. So essentially, like, is your, do you work on a fully centralized team with like your, your um, you know, you report up to another, to a data science manager? Do you uh, do sort of like a hub and spoke thing where you report to a data science manager, but kind of your day-to-day -day work, you're working with say like a product team, or are you fully embedded, uh, which was the case with at DataCamp for me, where I report to the, the VP of growth. Um, so I think that's sort of interesting, but that also is not necessarily something that always is, you know, the same within a subfield. So again, if I'd gone to say like a, a booking, a Google or whatever, I probably would have, their experimentation teams are often like the data scientists right there to work on experimentation full time. I actually would have been, uh, reporting to a data science manager, but at data camp where they were just starting, uh, it didn't make sense to have a team of data scientists doing experimentation. The idea instead was like we have an experimentation team where data science is one part of it. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, I could see how it really varies on the size of the company. Okay, I want to talk about one of my subfields uh, that I've listed. Yeah. Um, so one I wrote down was like op optimization, reinforcement learning, and like recommendation engine stuff. And that's a like is, cool thing, right? I feel cool. like that's what yeah, people think like, like data boring science. Boring A-B tests. Right, they're like, yeah. oh, that's awesome, right? Like that's, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, we that's should what talk, everyone wants to do. We should talk about why this is awesome because yeah. I don't know if it's awesome. <gasps> it's maybe awesome. Well, well, we'll talk about it. I'd like to, I'd like to explore that in a minute. Um, but let me give you the overview. Um, suppose you're a company and you have the ability to give different customers different discounts. Like every time they go to the website, you can give them a different amount of a discount. Um, you start by saying, hey, everyone gets a 10% discount. But then you could be like, well, maybe certain customers under certain conditions should get a 20%. Like if you haven't ordered in a while or things like that. And it's like, well, you as a human could set what those rules are, or you could use an algorithm to try, actually try this stuff out and be like, well, if we give these people 20%, uh, 20% discounts, what happens? Well, what about in this customer, we give this customer in this situation, this coupon, then what happens? Like this is, if you think about AV testing, that's like, I'm gonna give every customer a 20% discount or half a 20%, half a 10% and see what happens. Optimization is like the natural conclusion of this, of let's just have like the computer constantly be like testing things and giving people new stuff. So it's different than most machine learning. Cause like most machine learning is like, you have a model of like, you, you have, your input data and you have what you're trying to predict and your model will try and make the prediction. But here your model actually has to suggest an action like a discount to give, and then that will happen. And then you will learn from it and like a new model will be run. So it's like a continuous feedback loop. So that's called reinforcement learning. It is the core for many optimization algorithms for things like recommendation engines of like, hey, if Netflix shows you this type of movie, are you gonna click it? Should we show you it more? Um, so Emily said that this thing is cool. And 
I think people think it's cool because it's like, wow, the computer is learning for us and blah, blah, blah. And like, it feels like even like more mathematically fascinating than um, that stuff. I think, I don't know if this is true. So I haven't done that much in this field, but my PhD dissertation was all about this topic. And the thing about optimization is that it's incredibly fickle, right? Like it's incredibly fickle in that if you have too many offers to give out, the model won't necessarily figure out the right things. And like, what about there's noise? What if there's like weather and suddenly no one goes on that computer that weekend because there's a big storm and how does that affect your model? There's a thousand ways this can break. And this stuff only works if you have enough strong data, right? Like if you have a website, but only have 50 customers a week on that website, then your model isn't gonna have enough chances to learn because there just aren't enough opportunities for do it. Or even if you have millions of people on your website, if they don't actually buy stuff very often, then it may not be the case that you have enough data points for the model to learn. So there's a thousand ways this can go wrong. Um, I think this stuff is enormously tricky, which is why most companies have to be like Google size before they try it. Um, or like, it's just really tricky. And so I think it is cool. I think it's cool in that like, yeah, the computer's learning. I think it is incredibly frustrating and stressful. And often you can try stuff and it won't work. And I think maybe to the point we were saying earlier is this is one where I don't think you have nearly as much stakeholder. Like the stakeholders come to you and they're like, we want your Netflix movie recommendations to be better, but they're not gonna be like, have you considered the blah, blah, blah coefficient? Or, you know, like it's really, you are kind of on call for making the model work, not like and coming up with what's the good idea to make the model work rather than like a stakeholder uh, probably telling you that sort of stuff. So, yeah. And I think this is one of the ones like Jacqueline, you were saying this doesn't necessarily make sense to do unless you're at a certain scale. And kind of because of this, I think this is one of the ones that's most uh, like computer science heavy. So I worked with the search ranking team at Etsy, uh, right? And most of them came from computer science backgrounds because they were, you know, what they were trying to do was when you search for like, you know, a, a term on a jewelry on Etsy, there's something like 2 million listings or more that, that have jewelry, like somewhere in their title or their tags, or whatever that qualify. What ones do you show on the first page, right? And this is like a hugely computationally like intensive and expensive process to like train these recommendation algorithms. And like you're saying, Jacqueline, and then also like learn from, okay, we put this new like ranking algorithm, what do we do? Um, and so it isn't kind of enough to know the theory, right? Like you have to be able to write you know, perform a code, you have to be able to figure out like maybe you're doing it through distributed computing or whatever, or like cloud computing. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so I think that's that's one where like you have that kind of stat side as well, like what are the algorithms, but there's a lot of this computer science being able to write the, the code in a certain way that applies as well. Yeah, and to your point of like, look, AV testing is accessible. You can come in, run a test and it's go like, you, like, I have a doctorate in this stuff. I'm scared to go write this code because mm -hmm. I suspect if I write it 80% of the time, it will not work because the data is not there. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it is so hard to really make a dent in this sort of stuff. It's just very tricky. And so, like, yeah, you're limited to working at companies that are big enough to support this. And then you don't get to be, like, the, the starting founding person. Like, you have a giant team that you have to coordinate with. I don't know. It's like, eh. That's why, like, I don't know. I, I can see why people think it's cool, but I think it is maybe less cool than... Uh, and I would say, uh, like, what, what you sort of touched on is I think there are fewer of these positions than what we'll talk about, you know, in a little bit of kind of like product analytics, right? I think many more companies need that than companies that need, uh, you know, uh, you know, recommendation, like reinforcement algorithms type stuff. Yes, I think that is true. Do you want to talk about your next one? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so product analytics. So I just kind of touched on. So this is what I did at Etsy. I mentioned it as some experimentation. Uh, components, but basically the idea is it's just like supporting. So I worked with the search team, supporting a product team and kind of the questions they need answered with data. So in some cases that was like, hey, does this new design of the search page, like, does this work better than the old? And that was like A-B testing, but it might also be like, hey, you know, we're thinking of, um, you know, changing what we, you know, want to show when someone uh, searches something that has no result, but how many people do search things that have no results, right? And so, and what are the most common terms that people are searching that have no results? Um, you know, and so that's a question of like, okay, I like pull up, I like, you know, pull up the past searches, you know, using SQL here and getting, um, you know, maybe writing like a little short report or even just dropping in the Slack channel, like, hey, here's what I found. And also maybe with that, okay, if that's, happens, you know, 30,000 times a week, uh, you know, helping them understand doing, you know, for example, a power analysis, will we be able to, even if we 
you know, increase conversion by 5%, will we be able to detect that with an A-B test or is that going to take like 10 months to be adequately powered? Um, and, you know, I might also, so that kind of goes into thinking about like, what do we want to work on? Um, so product analytics, uh, you might be making a dashboard to help teams monitor certain metrics that they care about. Maybe you're going to, you know, write a, a more comprehensive report. Um, so yeah, it really kind of like runs the, runs the gamut of just sort of doing, you know, what your, your, what your team needs at the, at the moment in terms of having uh, numbers. And I think if we want something interesting we could talk about there is also the balance of kind of reactive. Uh, so like they're asking you questions like, hey, can you pull this number? Like, hey, you know, uh, can you look into more of this thing versus proactive and how much, you know, you sort of say like, hey, I think, you know, I should work on this for the next like week or two weeks. I think this is an important question we should answer. Well, I, I think what's interesting with what you described is product analytics really just seems like all of data science, but just focused on product stuff, right? Like you got your AV testing about products. And I think at some level it'd be like, well, then can you not just spe like, like, why would you specialize in it? It is just all the stuff. But I do think there's like a, it is easier if you are looking for a job on a product analytics team, it is easier if you've already had a data science job on a product analytics team, because you learn the lingo and like, how do people think about products and that sort of thing. So like, which is just to say, I think A-B testing and the recommendation and optimization stuff are both like specializations based on a particular like field of techno, like, like technical field. But I think product recommendation is specializing on the domain that you are thinking about, um, which is also important. Like, like that makes sense. And I think lots of people specialize in that way. Right. And some cases like I know is like they can specialize right in a certain kind of product or, you know, it's like marketing. Right. It's like learning like marketing analytics stuff and like how do you like ad campaigns? And you know, a lot of times when I've seen like marketing uh analysts or data scientist positions, they ask for previous experience in marketing because there's like specific um, you know, kind of tools like familiarity with, but also just familiarity with the field, right? Like how does like ad bidding work, right? Like how do campaigns work? Um, that's that's really helpful, or there are positions for growth. So, you know, I would say uh some cases like product analytics, right? It's you you can. I don't know necessarily, I guess you could say you could specialize in general, but I think really it would be, okay, you specialize in a certain area, in a certain product area instead, right? You specialize in marketing, you specialize in growth or whatever, and you kind of continue to work with those teams. And like you were saying, Jacqueline, you learn sort of the lingo and you learn the, the data science tools that are most effective in solving those types of problems. Yeah. Okay. So what's your hot take? How do you prioritize the... I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I, I don't know, because I think that was my first data science position. Um, and so I think this is also something just in general, honestly, about as you grow into, as you grow in your career of going from a little bit more like reactive, okay, I kind of like take what comes in, you know, like people are sending the priorities, you know, I execute versus when you grow more senior, like, part of your role is at, at good places it's expected but even if it's not necessarily like you should start doing it of uh, part of your role being like you make the recommendations right and so I know Jacqueline is like you know someone's been the head of uh, data science at places like this is yeah this has been a big a big part of your role is you decide okay what should we be working on yeah, but I think it's right. challenging I think that's a challenging switch honestly yeah but that's fun I don't know it is kind of like what being more senior is all about is deciding that stuff um Okay, we got two more on the list. I would like to briefly cover both of them just super fast because I think they're fairly similar. So the two, the, the last two subfields, and there are like hundreds of subfields. These are just talking points, but close your eyes, listeners, and think it. I'm sure you will come up with more on your own. Um, so the two more we have listed, written down. One is forecasting. And so forecasting person, it is a data scientist whose job it is, is to take historic data and use it to make trends to tell the business what to do. So like, if say you work at a, a company that produces airplanes, potentially one were to say, and then they need to know how many airplanes, you know, the market, they think the market's going to want in 20 years. Um, your job can be using mathematics and forecasting to take historic data, predict future growth trends, and then report that to the business so they know what build airplanes to start building now. I'm not going to mention any companies, but that does sure sound like something I might have done in my past. Um, and I think this one's really similar to A-B testing in the sense that like it is highly, it's like, it's a specialized technical field that it is easy to mess stuff up and get it wrong. And so like, you really want to be thoughtful. And also the business is really always breathing down you to be like, well, why are you projecting that low? You didn't account for our sale next year. Well, you need, you should raise the forecast higher. And like, there's a very stakeholder management aspect of that. And I think the way AB testing has it too. The other field I wanted to talk about is uh, fraud. 
Um, because I feel like I've seen most companies after a certain size have people whose whole job it is, is to just do data science to detect fraudulent purchases. And um, the thing about fraud is that I think in some ways it's kind of like product analytics where there's like all sorts of actual work within the fraud stuff. Like there's literally every time a transaction happens in a, in a hundredth of a second, predict if it's fraudulent or not to decline it or not. And then there's also like the fraud of like, hey, you know, we have retail stores. We think the employees might be abusing the discount codes. Can you detect that? And like, there's like a fair amount of, um, there's a fair amount of different types of problems here. And um, just like with product analytics, as you do more fraud, you will be able to get more fraud jobs and they'll want people with fraud experience. So you can like specialize in that area. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's just kind of point. There's like, there's lots of parallels and lots of these different fields. And like, I think there is like, there, are, well, and I guess we'll get into it after the break. There are pros and cons to specializing at all or staying more general. Yeah, and I, I'm curious with like the, the forecasting and, and fragile, do you, I mean, how do you, or maybe we should, well, tell me after I say it, if we should save it for after the break, but is this something that you think like, how do you, I feel like this would fall into the trap of like, I need experience to get experience. Right? Is that if they're looking for someone who's done fraud before to hire for the fraud job, but like then how do you, how does anyone ever get into the field in the first place? Or like the same thing with forecasting, like you know if you're, you're doing this big important thing for the company, what, what they want you to want to see evidence that you you know done successful forecasts before. Okay, so that's a great question, and I do think we should use that as the segue after our break. Sounds good. We clap. Ah. Yeah. Um, cool. Thank you, everyone, for sticking through the first half of this. Um, so we're going to do a second briefer half. Um, there's a sponsor in the middle. Just kind of work with it. And then after that, we'll open <laughs> it for questions for everyone. Um, you good, Emily? You good? good. Uh, did, I, I realized I, I had a meeting during this. Just like a real regular recording of this podcast, I was like, oh, crap, I have a meeting right now. I am not at. So I'm, I texted <laughs> them on my phone while we were talking. Like a regular podcast. <laughs> Jacqueline, head of data science, everyone. That's right. Um, this, is, this is what being a head of data science is all about. Um, meetings all day. Okay. Being bad at scheduling. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ready? Yeah. And then, wait, wait, wait. Oh, well, it's fine. So I will do the sponsor and then we'll just roll in. Right. Emily? Okay. Yep. Right. Okay. Here we go. This is going to take a little work. Okay. We can clap. One, two, three. Okay. Sunday, 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 this Sunday at the Tacoma Dome at 8 p.m., Data Scientists of the USA presents the seventh annual Data Science Monster Truck Spectacular. Be amazed as the random burning forest jumps five tree models in a row. Recoil as a, the lasso crushes cars to zero. Stare at the daring neural network collides into a tower of NAs. Tickets are now available at all Ticketmasters, AAA locations, and data science conferences. This Sunday at 8 p.m. at the Data Science Tacoma Dome, it's a data science orama. <laughs> okay, Jack, I think you need to explain like where okay. this comes I from. Realized I realized I didn't okay. know. No, like, yeah. So know first this? off, sorry, every one of our London listeners at this London UK based uh, yeah, thing. Yeah. This is an extremely American <laughs> reference. This was primarily in the 90s. They would have monster truck rallies that would, they basically, they go around the country. They'd bring a bunch of monster trucks and they'd like crush cars with them and stuff. And then they would also have these outrageous commercials to get people excited for them in that style I just did. Um, Emily and I, in preparing for this episode, realized Emily had never, um, never had seen one of these commercials before, which slayed me. Um, but I don't know. These are my bread and butter, I guess, as a 30 something American. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, someone in the chat says that as, as uh, they grew up in Indiana and they feel seen. So <laughs> yeah. there's one person out yeah. there got it. I don't know if they have that in the UK and I'm sorry if that just was <laughs> a weird thing you just had to sit there, but, um, so we were talking. Um, <laughs> right, right. How do you yeah. the, the need experience to get experience, which feels especially acute when like when you're specializing, right? It's like, don't they want evidence that you did this thing before? But then how do you ever get the chance to do the thing? So here is my theory. And I would like you to tell me what you think, because I think this is somewhat true for all of them. Forecasting example, I think A-B testing is a great example too, which is I think one way you can get in is that if they hire you as like an entry level person and they just throw you on that team. Right, because I think at the entry level, they do kind of have like, look, we just need people in places to like grow and you don't have any experience yet. So we're gonna put you on that team and you're gonna pick it up and that's fine. I think that is a thing that happens. And I think that is basically what happened to me and forecasting. Um, 
I think for other fields, what or other times, I think the other way you kind of get into this is like when your company is in a situation where they need an expert in that field, but they have no one and you're around and you're reasonably like, you know, good at picking up stuff. Then they'll be like, hey, you come work on this A-B testing thing real quick. And you're like, okay. And then you will pick it up that way. I've picked up a number of things, right? Like I, I've done A-B testing because I was at a company that was running A-B testing. There's no one else around. They're like, hey, Jacqueline, can you help us out with something real quick? I'm like, yeah, sure. And, you know, like I've picked stuff up like that. And eventually you do that enough times, you are then suddenly you find yourself as, you know, a distinguished person in that field or whatever. So I think those are the two ways you get in. I think sort of a third option maybe overlaps with the second, which is kind of what happened to me is you start out like more general, right? So even though I sort of said like, oh, I like product analytics, it's so still relatively generalized. That was like an entry level position. Um, and I did A-B testing as part of that. And actually I sort of started specializing within Etsy a little bit on that, um, like work with the experimentation team a little bit because just my stats background, like even though I hadn't done A-B testing before, I'd run experiments, like just like, you know, in a lab or whatever, psychology, um, or, or sort of online through uh, like Amazon MTurk. Uh, and then with that, I was able to get that, like, oh, this is my whole role at data camp. Cause I was like, look, I like did this. And also because I could benefit then for, you know, Etsy, while not as big as like, you know, the Google the booking, whatever, it did have a fairly mature experimentation system. So I like learned a lot of best practices of like, oh, this is what, you know, I could strive towards for like how the, um, you know, the website that reports experiment results or what experiments are running, like this, is what this looks for, like these, what the metrics airport, et cetera. Um, and I think that could be, you know, it's another path of like, you start out in sort of a more general position, but then you kind of, uh, you know, maybe it's because of what you said, like number two, where, there's no one else to do it. But even if there are, they're like, oh, this is part of your role. You do a little bit of forecasting, you do a little bit of this. And then you can leverage that into, if you want, into a role where that is your entire role. Yes. But I, I so I think there's kind of like, when I'm like, they just pull you in because you're around and you seem like you pick up stuff. There is like, they have to be able to squint and see a universe and where you are in that role, <laughs> right? Like if you like, like, oh God, do you have a stats degree? Do you, do you have the word stats like somewhere in your name? Like, like, is there something we can look at and be like, okay, you could yeah. maybe be able to handle this, but yes, no, I agree. Um, and, but also I think people, I think in general, people underestimate how often that happens and how quickly you can pick up new stuff. Like, I think, especially with more people who are aspiring data scientists and junior, like I kind of, I get this interpret like this impression that the, the belief is like, well, you need to study all this stuff and super advanced to be an expert. And then they hire you and then you stay in that role forever. But in fact, like, I don't know. I remember my first job, I was there for about a year. And then after a year, they're like, oh boy, the one data scientist who was doing all the recommendation stuff quit, you're in charge now. And I'm like, what? And this is before I had a PhD in it. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, have fun. You know, like that happens a lot. And like, that is how a lot of people who are now really good at that stuff started. And like, like, I don't know, careers are a journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do think, you know, I feel like this kind of uh, leads neatly into the like switching stuff, right? Because it's a little bit like, okay, going from like being specialized in nothing to being specialized in something, but also, you know, what if you want to, want to, you know, switch subfields? And I think one thing, uh, so someone I knew at Etsy was, you know, similar to me, was working kind of like product analytics stuff. Um, but was interested in doing more machine learning thing. And so what he ended up doing was he did Etsy had kind of like an internal, uh, he came from sort of a consulting background. So like with some stats, but more on the communication side, right? Like not very heavy computer science. Uh, so what he did was Etsy offer like kind of an internal uh, like bootcamp type thing where you could join and essentially be like a junior engineer on an engineering team um, for, you know, some months. And also he could bring like his expertise in analytics and the, and the data science side. Uh, so he did that and that kind of buffed up right his engineering skills um, and then eventually was able to make the transition internally to our search ranking team. Um, and so I think that was a case where he wasn't like, you know, picked up and being like, hey, you like, we don't have anyone you could, you, you know, you do this thing. There was a team that did it. Hey, kid, get right? in here. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very intentional decision of like, hey, I want to do this, but I realize I have some gaps in my, you know, skill. Um, and so he sort of like, you know, took kind of one step at a time and eventually was able to, you know, make that transition. I've seen uh, like Robert Chang, who we interviewed, so we have interviews and, you know, as a long time listener to the podcast now, we interview someone every chapter of the book, Robert Chang, we interviewed for chapter one, kind of did something like similar at Airbnb for starting out more analytics. Um, and he actually has like a GitHub repo 
where one of the things he had to do when he switched, you know, more towards like the machine learning side was uh, start using Python instead, because that's what people did. So he actually has a GitHub repo um, that was like his deliberate practice learning Python. And I think he mentions in the readme um, that he did this to kind of make this internal transfer within the Airbnb. I think that there's almost like switching is almost always good. Like when I think of all the times I've kind of switched what I was doing in my career, like I used to do all sorts of report, like building, using models to make reports to show executives and PowerPoints. And then I switched to putting stuff in production, right? Like I think all the switches for me have been universally good because even if it's like, I don't do it for that long and I go back to what I was doing before, I have gained new knowledge, which often helps me, right? Like, hey, knowing how to deploy an API can still be useful at times when you want to make like a hosting service to print your reports for you or something. And also it just gives you a bigger, like it gives you more ways to think about problems. I think it's very easy um, to kind of get stuck in one mindset. And then I think also to that point, I, I feel like I have watched people who really stay focused in one particular area and doing their one thing for a long time in their career. And then they struggle when that technology is outdated or that department's let go and like they have to switch. Like, like you probably are not going to be right now in whatever field, you are probably not going to be that in like 30 years. And if you can make those a nice and easy transitions instead of 29 years from now and suddenly being like, oh God, right? It's like, it's like, this is a really weird metaphor. It's like when they, like forest fires, you want to have like a lot of like small forest fires periodically to help nature instead of waiting 20 years for a forest fire and then all the wood is super primed to burn and then it all is like catastrophic, controlled burns. I don't know why I'm saying your career should be a lot of controlled burns, but here <laughs> I am, yeah. Um, right, and so, yeah, I, I think just embracing change is generally for me has been a positive. Yeah, I, I will say I, I agree, but also I do want to know, like, it could be, um, it could be hard emotionally. And so why that is, is because sometimes making these changes, it feels like going back to being a beginner. And I realized like, you know, one sort of struggle is, uh, so for example, you know, I was picking up recently, like, uh, tools with with AWS and lambdas and like you know deploying stuff and this is kind of like newer to me and I was trying to articulate like what you know why it's why it's hard like why it takes long and then I realized it's like a you know it's sort of missing this context and so what I mean is the other day something I am pretty familiar with is like programming in R and I was like okay I need to resize an image so I google like because I, I but I haven't done that sort of thing I google resize you know an image in R and the first results are something, or like a package on bioconductor. And I'm like, that feels, but like I have the context, I know bioconductors specifically for like, sort of biology type packages. And I'm like, that feels like there must be more general package. I kind of scroll through more results and I see the magic package and I go, oh, I remember reading like blog posts from people I trust. Like, yes, this is like a great image package. Let me do it this way. But that's because I had all this context from like years, of like sort of being in R, like knowing what these repositories are, like, following people like who, you know, and then it rings the bell. And when you're starting over position, like you don't have that. And it's so hard. It can be really kind of scary to feel like, oh, I'm years into my career, but I, I you know, I'm asking these questions that feel so basic, or I don't even know what question to ask. Uh, Cause I'm just like, I don't even like, you know, what is this even called? Or like, I, I don't, is this even like possible what I'm thinking about? Um, and so I do just want to share, like, it can be a, a tough experience to, go into something, especially if it's a, a subfield kind of fairly far from what you've been doing previously. Yes, but to- Better now <laughs> than 29 years from now? Two things. Well, I think that's one. Well, I will yeah. say one, I actually, I had to experience this myself. I work at a company that is primarily Python based and I'm more of an R person. And so I thankfully had co-workers who are extremely good at Python. And so every time I had any question, I'd be like, oh yeah, use the block package or, yes. oh yeah, that package is legit. And like having that has been extremely valuable for me. So I think getting those sorts of resources is important. But at some level, I will say, if you are uncomfortable being a beginner, the solution is to not avoid being a beginner. It's to learn how to be comfortable with that. Because like, <laughs> like fearing that not knowing what you're doing is like, it is very natural and fair and valid. And I have that too, but also can be totally catastrophic. Like it can lead you down dark places. Um, so if at all possible, the more you can work on trying to like accept that, hey, you're not always going to be the best at everything all the time. Like, no, eh, that's good. And I think though with that, it's like, it is an important component. Like you mentioned one thing that's so helpful, right? Is having the coworkers there. And I think like two things, obviously it's helpful. They're like, you know, a fountain of knowledge and they have this context. They're like probably better at Google in a lot of cases and faster. 
But also I think it's important to have like, there's a found like something called uh, psychological safety, which I think we've talked in the podcast before, feeling like it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to admit you don't know something because you know the, the people you're with, the environment you're in, you're not going to be made fun of. You're not going to be fired for, right? You're not going to be looked down. And so I think if you are going back to the beginner, it is important both to have, on, like just from a resource standpoint, it's super helpful to have like coworkers who, you know, who are, who are helpful, who are knowledgeable in this thing, but it's also important that they are supportive. And I think it is, and unfortunately not every environment is like that. And the one I'm in is that that's not the case, but I just want to say, I think people, you might've experienced that some environments that aren't like that, and it is not maybe safe to admit you don't know things. And so I do think this is an important thing to look for when you're looking at a team is, is this one where I can feel comfortable learning because obviously there's that personal kind of growth and mindset you need to work on, but that can be really handicapped by if you're not in an environment that supports you learning and understands that. I agree. I think that's totally true. Like it is, and like to my point, my current company is a very great environment for not being an expert in this language, but that happened to be luck that those happened at the same time. Um, so I want to close this part of the podcast with, we have listed on our notes the question of, uh, should you, what are the pros and cons of specializing at all? Like, should you specialize at all? I'd like to start just a quick discussion. Emily, do you think you've specialized? I think I've had, yeah, I would say like data camp, I was specialized in experimentation, but that said, I didn't, um, you know, I'd like, I like, I sort of faced that choice of, okay, do I really want to commit to this and sort of become like an experimentation person and sort of like have that be my like quote unquote brand or whatever. And I decided like, mm, at least not yet. Um, so, so yes and no, I guess like, yes, I have, but I think I have, I have not done it to the extent that like, okay, I've almost like committed for a while to doing this and become like a, a you know, an expert in it. Or yeah. And so I kind of feel something similar, which I will say at any one of my jobs, like back when I was consulting, especially for T-Mobile, I was a pretty big expert in putting R in production and NLP. And then, you know, in previous jobs, I was whatever, forecasting. But um, I ha don't have a single specialization over my career. So maybe it's like all vacuum, or maybe it's all like nonsense in the sense of like, you basically never specialize permanently. It's just like, what are you doing in any particular role? And um I just, yeah, I do think that maybe it's less a question of how much you specialize and more like, hey, you know, like I've learned that like maybe AB, like I've kind of written off AB testing is probably a thing I'm not going to focus on and think about the statistics. I know that's not really my thing and that's fine. And like, I know I'm not going to really want to do work. You know, it's just kind of like picking and choosing, like what are the parts of data science you like and want to do lots of work in? And what are the parts like, eh, not so much for you. And like, I don't know, maybe it's more of like a just kind of like, pruning than it is about like deciding that this is the thing you're specializing and now you're the expert in that. Yes. And uh, so, so before it's like, just like choosing a job, it's, it's very hard to know before you do it, whether or not you'll like it. Yeah. Um, that's okay. And you'll learn. Yes. Good. Okay. With that, let's take another break. No, you're looking. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. Good. And then we can unbreak and do questions and answers. So, okay. London audience for us. It would be quite helpful if any, you know, you all have questions. If you want to, um, if you want to, um, I don't know how we'll do this. Maybe we'll, um, I don't remember how we've done this previously. I guess, I don't know, come off mute, say something, have a chat with us and we'll talk about it and we'll kind of cycle through. We'll just and uh, like, like Jacqueline said before, if you don't feel comfortable coming off mute, totally fine to just post a question in the chat and then we'll just say it out loud for the recording. Yeah, that'll be fun. I'll be like a listener. Yes, yeah, a listener, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Not a so, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, three, two, one. All right, so with that, we have the closing segment of our um, podcast live episode where we're gonna ask the uh, Pi Ladies London group um, if some, some live Q&A. Um, so yes, audience, do you have any questions for me and Emily? And this can be on what we, obviously what we just talked about, the subfields, but also if you have general, data science career questions. We did write the you know, whole book on uh, you know, getting started, getting your first job, doing well in your job. So any, you know, anything around that, we'd be happy to answer. And actually, why don't, we, why don't we have you raise your hand in Zoom if you're interested? I think that would be easier than trying to coordinate people coming off me and then we'll say your name and stuff. Anyone? You guys gotta help us out though. 
like if you leave us with no questions will look weird and i guess we could just edit it out and be like we never asked that answer we never asked what are you talking about we did a q a at the end we all laughed we laughed (laughs) we we learned yeah oh yeah okay great okay good good. got two people okay (laughs) uh do you want to go first you're just first on my screen sure thank you i'm a big fan of your podcast um i'm getting interested in data science from um the legal perspective um i've been practicing as a lawyer i'm now back in university doing a master's that combines law and data science and i was wondering whether either of you've heard anything that intersects those two different worlds um because it seems quite niche i haven't answered this i do know people who work on this um the thing that I know of the intersection of legal and like data science is if you think about contracts, there are massive blocks of text that sometimes it is impractical to read all of, right? And these are legal documents. Um, but if, like, and if you imagine, suppose you're a, a Fortune 50 company and you have, you know, vendors and each vendor has a contract and those contracts are supposed to be all the same, but each vendor kind of like wiggles the words around here and there. Like using data science to try and like take large amounts of legal documents and determine like, well, what are the similarities? What are the unique things? What do we need to be concerned about and like have a human look at? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So so my understanding is like, I don't think it's an, it's a huge field, but I do think this idea of like using data science to analyze legal documents in bulk is something that people are thinking about. Yeah, I think you could also look at potentially um, like, uh, you know, some like nonprofits and stuff or other things where uh, maybe they focus on, um, you know, like uh, uh, lawyers like legal issues or something and use data science. So the ACLU has a big data science team. I think most of them are not former lawyers, but that could probably be a really interesting perspective to have since they often work with the with the legal team there. Um, so I think you could look at stuff like that, be like, okay, where's a, a startup that has that has lawyers that deals in law um, and can they, or it doesn't have to be a startup, right? Or a nonprofit or whatever. Um, and do they need data science help? Um, where me having that legal background would be a would be a big bonus. And I will. I know a paralegal who is having similar questions. Um, and I think one other thing I would say is also I would use the fact that you are a lawyer in like the interview process. And when people be like, ah, so you just started data science? Like, ah, but I used to do law, which is all about legal, like legal analysis and thought. And like the, I think you can make a compelling argument that the work of law is actually. At, like on its inside, not that different from doing a data science analysis. It just is it words or numbers. Um, and I, I would try and lean into that if I were you as like a narrative to help get a job. Yeah. And I think just sort of end that for you know people listening who aren't who aren't lawyers know that background, but I do think as a kind of general principle, what Jacqueline says and what we've said a lot is you'll really think about okay, don't be like, oh, it's basically like I'm starting over. It's like, no, 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 your career up to now has been really valuable. And how can you sort of draw the parallels either with the domain knowledge you have or again like the communication skills you've had to build, right? Like, like how, you know, all the transferable skills you have or, you know, working with, with numbers, even if not like, a, you know, as a data scientist, um, because that can really, that can really help you. Um, great. So hopefully that did help. And then let's move on to uh, Antonio has a question for us. Hello, ladies. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I really enjoyed um, uh, both of you, your knowledge, and uh, thanks for sharing. I'm actually in Madrid. I came across your event because it was published here as well. And um, I guess we are a bit um, behind uh, the UK uh, regarding technology. So um, I'm having a couple of questions for you. I'm, uh, my background is uh, I'm a marketeer. Um, so I've been working in the digital like for the last 10 years. I actually started in London back in the days, moved back to Spain and uh, digital uh, um, was in the, its nappies in the beginning. Now it's um, there's a lot of people uh, in the field and me personally, I started enjoying more and more the uh, side of analyzing uh, data. Uh, consumer behavior and uh, well, um, the stuff regarding A-B testing as well and everything related to uh, uh, marketing and marketplaces. And I've been uh, kind of interested in this field recently, um, having all these ads uh, chasing me actually, uh, uh, because I've been uh, searching for, uh, for stuff. And uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, one of them, um, 
there are so many sources that I've been kind of doing some uh, self-learning myself. Uh, first question, uh, taking into account that I'm not new to certain analytic, uh, analytics uh, tools, but uh, from, uh, um, I would say, in a smaller scale, uh, and um, how would you, what do you, what do you think about the uh, self-learning uh, regarding this field? Because uh, I see so many boot camps and I see so many uh, different courses and uh, 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 three, four years courses, and so I'm, I'm I'm getting a bit messed up. And the other thing, <laughs> I'm also uh, thinking of. Um, I think you were uh, kind of saying that um, because it's kind of a new field, there is. Um, um, mm, I mean, it's okay to be in a, to, uh, it's, it's okay being a junior again, which I think I enjoyed a lot in my career as well. Uh, but I'm a bit concerned about about the age thing, uh, even though I have a, a um, um, a number of years uh, in the, in the marketing field. I'm uh, 40 plus, so I'm just thinking what it would feel like landing into teams um, uh, where probably uh, most people are. I don't know. I guess around 30, maybe. Those two questions. Thank you so much again. So I can answer, uh, or sorry, answer the first one. Uh, so basically, you know, like, so that's a question, right, about self learning. Uh, so, you know, we talked all, about this a lot in uh, chapter three, or I guess episode three as well. Um, and basically, I think self learning is great. Um, I think it can have its, uh, you know, it can be challenging to, you know, say like the advantages of a boot camp or a master's degree, right? Is you have this accountability, you have the structure, you have like, you know, here's what you're going to be doing versus, you know, self-learning. There's tons of online courses or books out there. Um, but, you know, if, if you are able to kind of have the discipline, if you're able to learn effectively, um, then I think, you know, certainly I think basically all the material in terms of like the technical knowledge you learn through like a boot camp or course is available. Um, you know, either online, usually for free or, or in a textbook. Um, and I think in terms of like the value to employers, I think, especially for someone with a fair amount of experience, that sort of like, if you can bring that self-learning and use it in your current job, like let's say you're like, okay, I'm going to start learning like this programming language, I'm going to use this technique. If there's any way you can apply that in the job you're doing, uh, that makes it extra effective when you want to apply to, to future jobs. Um, and I think, you know, you don't necessarily need that, like, you know, that, that boot camp or that, that, you know, master's degree or whatever, especially because as you said, that's a fair amount of uh, financial and time investment. Um, for the second part about the age discrimination, I do think age discrimination is real, like, and I think it's, um, I do think it's tricky and you have to think about it. I, I think right now it's a good time because by being remote, I think it's less obvious. And I think you can do things on your resume um, that maybe like obfuscate a little bit. Um, and not make it necessarily as obvious, but I would just try and, um, I think once you get a job, it will be okay. But I think the hard part is just making sure people in the interview process aren't writing you off because of your age, which is not morally right, but is the thing that happens. Legal, and yeah. yeah, I wish I had, I don't know, this is the same thing. So it said, is sexism and data science a real problem? <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I'm like, I don't, I wish <laughs> I had some quick wins for that, but like, I think it's just like be thoughtful about it. I think there are probably, you know, I would Google online and see what yeah. like people in this field have written about it. Like I'm, I, I'm on the younger side, so I haven't had to face it as much. Um, but I do think that is like it exists. I would take it seriously, and I would try and just be thoughtful on how to navigate it. And I, I think the last part is like looking for a company like maybe a startup of 15 people founded by like three white dudes who are 23 is like, maybe not going to be like the, you know, the best place, right? Or, the, or, or you know, the only people like, oh, like, yeah, like 50 people, like maybe we should have someone like over like, you know, like 35 being like the really old age, right? Versus some like more established companies, you know, you have people, like, I don't know, like IBM, right? I'm sure there's lots of teams where it has people in their 40s and their 50s, right? And I think maybe there it's more challenging being like, oh, I'm, the same age, but if they've been in this exact field their whole life, like we have different sort of experience levels, but you could look for teams, you can look for companies where, um, you know, you wouldn't be sort of like the odd one out. Cause I think that's what I say to people, you know, around the sexism is like, you know, even the company, maybe you don't want to be the only woman on like a team of like, you know, the technical team of 20, yeah. like that's probably not going to be a, a great experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thanks so much. I appreciate your sincerity and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a thought. And um, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll see you um, 
as soon and i will try to uh, jump on to um your events more more often thanks so much thank you i will also okay, so, oh, oh, we I have two yeah. oh bah, what ah bah. i just bah. want to say one one quick thing for us off the agent is there are, are lots of awesome data scientists in the 40s so i just want to shout out like sometimes it can feel like oh my god it's all the same people but um like there's some really really great people there too who are like you know who have kids who have families who have you know are older so yes uh -huh. i agree with that that too. Okay, we have two. We have two questions in the chat, and we'll call it a day because we are running out of time. So the first one is from Madeline. I'm gonna slightly abbreviate it. I'm working as a software engineer, and I'm thinking of moving into data analysis. Um, in your experience, how easy or hard is it to break into data science without a master's degree or PhD in like a data science field? Do you have any advice about this? What do you so think, def Emily? Definitely don't need a data science degree because uh, that also didn't exist for like most of us who entered the field. Like uh, there was that wasn't an option when I was an undergrad graduating in 2014. Um, I do think sometimes you'll see, you know, more often uh, like a STEM degree or something, right? They'll be like, you know, like, e.g., computer science, like uh, statistics, whatever. What I what I took out, I, I should have I shouldn't have saved time this way. She has a degree in psychology, so it's like okay. a. a yeah, yeah. I so think I'd say that that's like sort of on the board. I mean, that's similar to what my degree is. I think, you know, definitely emphasize like, uh, you know, if, if you, you know, like the statistics classes, you might take the study design stuff. Um, I do think I want to say like specifically for software engineer, I think that's an excellent background for data science. And a lot of teams can really use someone who, you know, has that experience. So I think that is uh, super relevant. Um, I would but, say, um, oh, I would also just say, um, Getting your first data science job is all about showing you have the experience to do it, which could be a boot camp, which could be a project that's really relevant, which could be a degree. Um, we have a whole chapter on this, chapter three in our book, which kind of covers this in particular, but it's just about getting something on your resume that people can look at and be like, oh yes, um, Madeline can do data science. I can see that right here. Um, and I would think about yeah. it that way. And then but I it's think definitely once you possible. Have, yeah. And once you have that, your education becomes like less and less important, right? As you like, you're like, oh no, they worked as a data scientist at this company. Uh, yeah. Last thing I'll say on that for a PhD, don't get a PhD. Listen to a bonus episode about what you should be our, like, a PhD. Like, that yeah. should be the tagline of our podcast. Build a career in data science and yes. don't get a PhD. <laughs> and don't get a PhD. And the last thing I will say is like really... When you're looking, like maybe at the end of the day, you, you decide to become like the master's degree is the right way to go. It's like, oh, I just want more formal training, whatever. But I would say, you know, again, that's that's expensive, that's time consuming. Is first try doing like a personal project, first try doing stuff like at your current job, try applying to places, try getting feedback from people. If you aren't getting the jobs, making sure, okay, is that because you don't have a master? Is this because of some other thing that's like actually not related? Um, you know, because, you know, again, just sort of see, okay, what are your, your options right now? And then, uh, you know, going in fully informed if you do decide to go the route of more formal education. Yes. OK, and then the second question from the audience in the chat is from uh, Snehal. And it says, um, thank you both for the talk. Two questions. How does one get started in data science career? Courses, books? How do you build credibility to get the first job? I am returning to work. As I said, career break. I have a CS background. I know exactly one book that you should get to help yes. you with this. It is called <laughs> Build a Career in Data Science. It is available at festbook.cool. Use the code buildbook40% for 40% off that code. Um, but seriously, that book is, if you're like, man, I wish Jacqueline and Emily just wrote down everything they possibly knew yes. about getting started in data science. That would be that book. So I, 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 I am being glib, but also I do mean it there. <laughs> and, the second I, question. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. oh, and I will just add for that. I think one thing this book offers is hopefully it answers a lot of your questions, but again, it also should give you those contexts to like ask better, but like you're like, okay, I get the sort of foundation, I get the overview, and now I know what more specific questions to ask rather than being like, I don't even know what's happening. Yes. And the second one, uh, do you have to choose a domain first? Uh, do you choose a domain first? And does that choice influence what you learn or what you specialize in? Thank you. I do not think you should do this. I think you should, in general, just study data science and do what's interesting to you and see whatever domain you like, or you land in, sorry. Anytime I've been like trying to focus on the domain, like, oh, I'm gonna go in this field or this domain, it has gone much less well than just like, I'm gonna learn data science and then tackle the problems that have been presented to me. I will put a caveat for that. I think I've done similar to Jacqueline, but I feel like there are some people who are like, I am really interested in the medical field. Like I'm really interested in using data science to like solve these types of problems. And I think that's a little bit of a different case. 
That's true. Like law. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Or like, I want to like, you know, help cure cancer. It's like, okay, you found like sort of a, spe- you know, then there's, I'm sure there's more yeah. specialties to like, got your starting point. Yeah. Yeah. But only if you really have a domain of mind, would I do that otherwise? Yes, yes. I wouldn't be like, oh, I gotta like find one. No, I think it's okay to just start more general and be like, let me, yeah, do programming and, and stuff. So. And with that, let us end this episode. Um, so with that, um, that's our show for this week. Check us out on our next full episode at question mark, question mark, because <laughs> who's the same? Will there be we'll one? Do? We Who leave knows? this line in the script and now we are just doing <laughs> every episode. Someday, perhaps there will be a season two or another bonus episode, but who, when that day is, uh, dear listeners, I do not know. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on whatever podcast app you use. If you have a question or feedback, please send an uh, email podcast at bestbook.cool. You can buy a copy at bestbook.cool and use the code buildbook40%. That's a four zero and a percent symbol for 40% off. Our theme song is by the extremely funny Matt Bouchelle. And thanks to our publisher, Manning, for helping our book exist. We didn't pick out a thing. To you, okay, anyway. wait, hold on. Before we end it. All right, we'll stop in here for a second because we always end with a funny tagline. And we yeah. didn't. Um, 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 oh my goodness. What do people do these days? Um, Jacqueline usually thinks of this stuff. May you have... May you may your you may your GPU drivers correctly install. Why don't you say that? That's a good one because they never do. And may your GPU drivers correctly install. Excellent. Okay, great, good. Cool. Thank you, okay. everyone. Yeah, this is great. Good yeah. questions. Um, yeah, and as we've kind of said throughout, like I said, if if you haven't listened to our podcast before might be useful, you know, obviously the book, even 40% off does cost some money, uh, but the, although there's the free book that's available, but of course the, the podcast is free. Uh, we did one episode for the chapter of our book um, that also includes a lot more. Uh, so it sort of does some of the highlights from that chapter on that topic, and it also includes some personal stories. So, um, you know, you can check that out and you don't have to listen to, you know, say you're, only, you're most interested in what's in episode 88. You don't have to listen to episodes one through seven. You can just jump to episode eight. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Emily. That was really cool, really entertaining to see you all record an episode live. Um, And thank you all for attending, for asking good questions. Um, And with that, I'll call it a night and let you go. And I'll see you all in next month's meetup, which will be announced in about two weeks. All right. Thank you, everyone.